church. Amen. And just in our attention Bibles, turn to Revelations chapter 3. Revelations chapter 3. I want to thank my superior for the answer for this opportunity. This is presenting the Lord's Word. Revelations chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 1. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have, found, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. You know, that's the goal of the whole conference, to strengthen the things that remain. As we look at our young adults, we look at Christianity in the whole of the Bahamas. We see a lot of people straying away from God, they stray away from church, but we have those who are here. And our goal for this whole week was to strengthen those that remain. We want to be an encouragement. Every preacher wanted to be an encouragement. Every song, every testimony was an encouragement so we can stay inside the fight, so we continue serving an almighty God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity just to be in your house. We thank you for the opportunity to worship. We thank you for the opportunity just to be able just to sing about your grace and about your mercy. Father, as we open up your word, God, we ask that you will show us something inside your word. Father, we ask that your spirit would walk through the aisles, speak to hearts. Father, help us to cast all our cares aside and just come for a brief moment just to meditate upon you. Father, come for a moment just to hear from your word. Father, that God help us, dear God, to truly be the Christians that you love for us to be. Father, we thank you. Father, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Bob. This is the book of Judges. Judges. I was talking to Brother Copley about two or three weeks ago. And Brother Justin and Brother O'Neill and I, we had a similar conversation. And in the book of Judges, it says in Judges chapter 2, at verse 9, it says, And they buried him in the water of his inheritance in Timothias, in the mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all the generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. You know, it's amazing. We look at the Bible, and the Bible tells us that there rose a generation who knew not God. When we look at our country, we see people who they throw away God's name, they throw away the Bible, they throw away everything that has to do with Christianity. And as we look at the verse, the verse tells us in the latter part, it says, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. You see, in the Jewish culture, it was the responsibility of the fathers to pass on the heritage. So it tells me inside this verse, it tells me that the fathers failed to teach the children the works and the wonders of God. You know, it's our duty to pass on our faith to the next generation. To pass on what we believe to the next generation. To pass on our passion for Christ to the next generation. And the Bible tells us clearly that there was a generation who do not go by. The fathers failed to teach them the works and the wonders of God. If we fail to teach our children the works and wonders of God, there will arise a generation who do not go If we fail to teach them how to read the Bible, how to come to church, how to sing unto God, there will arise a generation who do not go And as we look in the corner of the Bahamas, so many times we come to church and we go through the whole mundane ritual of coming to church, dressing up, and, and looking all Christian-y. And then inside our lives, we're so far away from God. Yeah. You know, the Bible says they, they confess me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You know, we can get up here and you know, preaching is the, is the, how can I put it, the glamorous side of Christianity, but it's actually living it up. It's actually doing the things that we say that we do. You know, when preachers get behind the pulpit and they, and they preach the word of God, you have three types of preachers. You have preachers who sit down there and they preach and they declare, thus said the Lord. Then you have some preachers who preach based upon their experience. And then you have some preachers who preach, they're proven God. As I look at the men inside Christianity, inside
I was talking about some Bible study pastor with Pastor Kerry. Look at all our pastors. They've proven God. Now it's up to us to prove God. Because they've taught us the works and the wonders of God. Now it's up to our generation to pass it on. Amen. And if we fail to do it, there will arise a generation who will not God. You know, but it's so easy to say live for God. It's so easy to say do the right things. Turn, turn with me again. Turn to Jeremiah. We're going to get to our text. We won't be long. Jeremiah. It says in Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marked in the hand of the potter. You know, it didn't say the clay came out of the potter's hand. Now, the clay is you and I. Once we're in the potter's hand, we're in the will of God. Once we're in the potter's hand, we're in his presence, and, and we have all those things. But the Bible says the clay was marred in the potter's hand. Yeah. You know, so many times we have Christians, and you know, when they stray away from God, and we sit down and we tell them, you've got to come back to God, and, and they should come back to God, and we tell them all those things. So what about those Christians who are in the will of God? And sickness arises. They are reading their Bibles, they're doing the things they're supposed to be doing, and then something happens. What do we preach them? What do we tell those Christians who are trying to do their best and they still struggle with life? You know, the Bible says this. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. The Bible says in Job, minus a few days full of trouble. The Bible tells us inside that same chapter, it says that um, Job, he had a night time that he was going through. The Bible also says, this peace that he gives not peace of the world. And the Bible tells us, Jesus made a statement to the disciples that trouble will come. Yeah. The general consensus about life is that trouble will come. But how we handle the trouble, when we go through the trouble, and when we go through the trouble, what's going to happen? What's next? I'm pretty sure I'm going to start here. We, we want to serve God. We want to do what's right. Yeah. We want to have that hope. We want to get our lives in order. We want God to place His power on our lives. I, I'm pretty sure that I'm hopefully, I'm prayerfully thinking that everyone wants that for their lives. But each and every one of us inside of here have our struggles. Each and every one of us, we have our troubles. We have situations that we go through. We have trials, testings, and tribulations. Let's turn to our text tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. It says in Jeremiah 18 and verse 4, it says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. You know, I learned something this year. My father said that God, show me a verse inside you, has a right his creation. And I sat down there and I said, that's a strange thing. You know, if you read Isaiah 53, and we sit down there and we said, who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? The Romans crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And we sit down and we say, oh no, the people, the Jews crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 verse 10, it, grew, it, it, it pleased the Lord to bruise his own son. The Lord has the right to his creation. When trials and testings come our way, you know, it's hard to say, no, God, you have the right yeah. to your creation. Yeah. Sickness comes your way. It's hard to say, God, you, you have the right, especially when you're trying to do your best. Yeah. It's hard to say, God, you have the right to your creation. Yeah. Let's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And we'll keep going on. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I think John can fast out that night, but just. <laughs> Everyone want to get up in time. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20. No, started last night. Started last night. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Verse 1. 
It says, It came to pass after this, also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, with them, other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side of Syria. And behold, they be in Hazastamah, which is in Gidi. And Jehoshaphat feared, and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah, and they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and givest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein, and have built the sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, This is Jehoshaphat's prayer. If when evil cometh upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house in the presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and come. And now behold the children of Ammon, and Moab, and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. Verse 12, we find our text. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Perish we are hopeless to say. Neither know we what to do. You know, Jehoshaphat, if you read this in, in, in chapter 19 and verse 3, it says, Nevertheless, this is Jehu talking about Jehoshaphat. It says, Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the rules out of the land and hast prepared thy heart to seek God. When Jehoshaphat came into his kingship, he tore down all the high places. He threw out all the groves, he threw out all the idols. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. Then the Bible says inside verse 20, in chapter 20 and verse 1, it says the Moabites and the Ammon, basically the enemies of God, came against God, and they came against Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat found the message, and he began to pray. And as he began to pray, he lists all these things before God. God, didn't you drive them out? God, aren't you the God in heaven? All those things. And then we come down to verse 12. He says, O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? No. For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. The definition of hopelessness is Lack of hope, passion, or zeal. No expectation of future improvements or success. Charles Spurgeon made a statement, Hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, only to be discovered in the night of adversity. I'm going to read it again. It says, Hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, but only to be discovered in the night of adversity. Now as we look at Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat heard that the enemies of God came against him. The Bible says Jehoshaphat began to pray to God. <coughs> then the Bible says, neither know we what to do in his prayer. He's confessing that God I'm hopeless. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. But here's the rest of the verse. It says, but our eyes are upon thee. The title of our message tonight is Preparation for Hope. But the Bible tells us inside Job chapter 5 and verse 6 and 7 it says, 
although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither does trouble spring out of the ground. Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. John 16 and verse 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Yeah. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The Bible says in John 14 and verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house are many mansions, and if it was not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again, I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It says in John 14 and verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We're going to spend some time inside this chapter. Let's look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, And Jehoshaphat fared, and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaim a fast through all, throughout all Judah. It says inside 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse 3, it says, that about Jehoshaphat, it says, I hast prepared thine heart to seek God. You know, a lot of times we go through trials, we go through testings. We have the storms of life, we have situations that we're faced with each and every day. We have problems inside this life, whether it's marital problems, whether it's financial problems, whether it's health problems. We all have situations that we're going through, we all have troubles that we're going through. And the Bible says that before troubles hit Jehoshaphat, the Bible says he prepared his heart to seek God. It means that Jehoshaphat was in a position to expect trouble to come his way. And the Bible tells us that inside the same chapter, it says in verse 3, as we go on to verse 4, it says, And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. When we think about the whole conference, the reason why we're gathering together is to ask help of Almighty God. One thing we know, trouble is coming. Yeah. Either someone's going through trouble, either trouble is about to come, or either we just pass through trouble. That's for sure. And the Bible tells us inside verse 4, it says that and Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah the king, to seek the Lord. And a lot of times we come to church, and we come to church for the wrong reasons. A lot of times we profess Christianity for the wrong reasons. A lot of times when we come to church, you know, when I look at my teenagers sometimes inside my church, and I see them just zoom up. And I sit down and I ask them a lot of times in our teens in the Zoom class, I said, why are we here? Well, what did we really come to do? We came to worship God. We came to seek God. And when the preacher gets behind the pulpit, whether it's in the Living Baptist Church, Victory Baptist Church, New Testament Baptist Church, that's the time that we should perk up because we're going to hear from God. And God is now going to tell us what we need to do to help us to be better Christians inside the faith. But a lot of times when we sit down there, we go through our own trials and testings and we just zoom out. Sometimes when we come to church and because the pressures of life is just bombard us on a daily basis, we sit down there with an apathetic look on our face and we just zoom out, we're just numb to the fact that we're just sucking on our tongue and our eyes just glaze by and we just sitting there, let's get it over with. Wow. Do you know? You know, I, I was talking to Kobe. I talked to Kobe more. Yeah, right. I talked to Kobe more. And you know, Kobe said, brother, you all know how brother Kobe is talking. He said, you know, our people, we don't, we don't know how to handle trials and testings anymore. And I said, that's true. And I think it's a lot of times because we're not prepared for it. You know, when you look at Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat prepared himself to face these trials and testings that he was about to deal with. Because as we look inside the chapters, we're going to look inside the chapter in the next 15 minutes. We're going to see Jehoshaphat did some things and he said some things inside this chapter that I believe that can help us prepare for whatever storm, whatever trial that we're about to face. We're going to look at four principles before we get inside our four points. Before we get to our four points. The Bible says in verse 5, it says, And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of God, of Judah, and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new court. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? 
and in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. You know, we serve a sovereign God. And as I look at Jehoshaphat, he was talking about the sovereignty of Almighty God. You know, a lot of times when we face our situations, when we face our trials, sometimes we forget that God is sovereign. Sometimes we forget that God is in control of every single thing that we go through. The Bible says, George, I looked to my left, I looked to my right, and he couldn't find God because he knew. Look, turn with me to Job. Turn to Job. Turn to Job. Turn to Job. Job chapter 1. Just look at verse 5. It says, And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continue. And here's what's happening. The Bible says that Job, he made sacrifice for his children just in case. They sinned against God. He was preparing them for what was about to happen. Now, I can imagine that Job did it for his children. He prepared himself to face whatever trial. Because the Bible says Job, he retained his integrity. Job stood steadfast in the midst of trials and testings when it came to Almighty God. As I look, ladies and gentlemen, we have to prepare the next generation to face the trials, to face the testings, to face everything that we go through. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that we're failing the next generation. Because a lot of times we tell them, hey, now understand me very carefully. We tell them, just apply Jesus. You know, we tell them, Jesus is the answer. We tell them, you go ahead, you do all those things, but we need to show them, how do you apply Jesus? If you sit down and you look inside our Bibles, the Bible not only says that Jesus is the answer, but he gives us steps on how we can get it done. The Bible says we ought to read our Bibles. We ought to pray. We ought to live a chaste life. We ought to do certain things to permeate the relationship that we should have with Almighty Lord. The Bible says in the Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, but to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The Bible says in Revelation 4, verse 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. Glory, honor, and power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They are and were created. Sometimes we tell our children you can live for the money, you can live for the faith. No, we ought to tell them they can live for God because the purpose of their life is wrapped up in a person called Jesus. That's why the Bible says this in Romans 8 and verse 28. It says, For all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who have called upon their purpose. How can we tell a young girl who just got raped? Hey, that's good. Someone who just lost their father or mother. Hey, that's good. We just apply Jesus. Just, just sing it out. The next verse says this. For whom I did foreknow, I did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of my son. Here is why it happened to you. God is just forming you. He's getting that clay. And as you are inside the potter's hand, he's forming you and fashioning you into the image of Christ. Because if we sit down there and just give them those type of things, if we don't teach our children, someone else is going to teach our child. If we don't pour into them the word of God, the precepts and the guidelines of God's word, someone else is going to pour something in them. And then we're surprised why they drop out of church. We're surprised why they don't say. We're surprised why they don't sit down and come to Almighty God. Why they don't sit down there and dedicate their lives. God. And the reason being, we're pouring the wrong things into our children. We allow them to sit down and watch TV all day. They glaze over on their cell phones and they spend more time doing that because mind you, children duplicate what they see. If you want to sit down there, you want to you want to check your Christianity, just look at your child. The apple will fall too far from the tree. You'll never find an orange fruit next to apple tree. That don't work. If you want to glimpse your Christianity, look at your children. Churches, if we want a glimpse of what we're producing, look at our young adults. That's right. I know. That's right. You see, we, we, we have to put the word of God in the proper perspective. Yeah. You know, the Bible says in Titus, it says in Titus 2, it says that the older women should teach the younger women how to be people of home and how to love their wives. How to, woo! <laughs> Rewind. How to love their husbands. Yeah. We don't believe in that. <laughs> so we want to teach them how to love their husbands. The older women teach the younger women. But you know, a lot of times inside our churches, the older women are taking back because these young adults are like, I got it all. And you know, being a young adult, sometimes we think we got it all. We don't know. 
Right. Uh, we've never experienced nothing. Right. We haven't proven nothing inside those that our faith is still wrapped up in our parents. That our biblical core of our faith is still connected to our parents. And we sit down and we think we got it all on that. But I let me admonish you, older women, continue teaching. Continue teaching the younger women because the Bible is the Bible plays it right up. And if you want to realize why we're not producing or why our young people are keep dropping on the church, because the older adult is supposed to teach the younger adults. And that cycle is supposed to continue going on. When you sit down and says the older men are supposed to teach the younger men. When we sit down and we look at it, and it helps the whole cycle. Right. When we fail to follow God's path, <coughs> we fall into foolishness. We look at our churches, and we sit down and we pat ourselves on the back, and we sit down and we have a good conference. After the conference, like, what are we going to implement? Well, what are we going to get from Monday night? What are we going to get from Tuesday night? What are we going to get? Don't sit down and just, just come to church and be glad I heard some good preaching. No, what are we going to do about it? Because if we look at Christianity, the Bahamas, we confess out the truth and we're fitting our commonwealth of the Bahamas. We don't have no passion for souls. We don't have no passion for the living God because we're not following God's word. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to get back to the book. We've we, 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 we got to get back to the book. We sit down there, we can put all the conferences together. We can sit down and put all the camps together. We can do all those things. Unless we get back to the book, and it's all in vain, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us that if we don't follow God's plan, and there's no other plan but God's plan. I don't mean Drake's song. I mean the Bible. There's no plan but God's plan, ladies and gentlemen. So we need to follow God's word. We need to follow God's plan. We need to sit down there and read the word of God and apply it to our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank the Lord for my mother and my father. I thank the Lord for giving me a praying mother. Yeah. You know, my mother taught me, she said, look, you've got to have an altar for yourself. There are going to be some things that you're going to go through, and you're going to be some things you're going to sit down there, and you're going to wish it never happened, but you have to learn to pray. My father sat down and taught me how to stand the test of times. People can say my mind things about you. They don't believe in honest Right. My dad said, Ricardo, the righteous as bulls lie. Right. But the wicked fear when no man pursue it. Right. You know, I love that Jesus, Jesus yes. never answered anything. He said, What says thou about thy sins? He said, I kept quiet. But he was going to pilot about this one, and he just kept quiet. And he said, And they made all the railing accusations against him. And he said, The proof is inside the wood, look at my life. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be able to follow God's word. We have to sit down there and implement God's word each and every day inside our lives because our young people are depending upon it. But if you look at the next generation behind us, if you don't pour God into them, they're going to fail. They will fail inside their marriages. They will fail inside their families. They will fail in rearing their children. They will fail in living for God. They will fail in reaching this commonwealth of the Bahamas for honor, honor and glory of God. If we don't pour the Bible into them, they're sitting down there, they're getting glazed over by Joel Osteen and all these other things, and that, that's good for the time being, the daily bread, the, the, the cloud devotions that we read. It's not a substitute for God's word. The Bible is sanctified by truth. That word is true. The Bible says when you of my word, when I'm exalted, hey, I will draw all men. We're not lifting up God's word, we're lifting up everything else but Almighty God. We have to get back to the book because it's the Bible that stands for it. Hey, no other book has stood the test of time, like our King James Bible. No other book has sat down there and changed lives, changed generations, I and mean, it changed societies and civilizations. It's this Bible right here. I don't think now, friend. Hey, we don't live by it. The Bible says, Abraham, stop it not at the promises of God. Even if you are like a drunken man, no. The Bible says he was steadfast. He believed Almighty God. Ladies and gentlemen, we gotta get back to the book. We gotta put the book inside our children's lives. The next generation depends upon it. You know what I'm like pass away and his wife? They pour into their children. One thing they said will pass away, he loved his boy. One thing they said was made, don't stop loving your boys. Continue to put Hey, AJ, David, listen to your mother. Don't listen to the crowd around you. Listen to a godly mother. Listen to your godly father. Allow them to direct your path. Sometimes you may get upset at them. Sometimes they may say, oh, you keep putting on over and over again. Hey, you can need it, friend. I promise you, you can need it. Hey, listen to your godly parent because they're going to help you. For those who don't have a godly parent, hey, listen to your pastor. Listen to your youth pastor. Hey, listen to the word of God. I promise you, we're failing the next generation if we don't pour the word of God inside their life. That's why our children grow up and they get involved in the things they're not supposed to get involved into. They get into marriages and they do things they're not supposed to because why? They ain't prepared. Listen. Listen to your mother. Listen to your daddy. Take it from a man. Listen to your mother. 
listen to your daddy. When you find a girl, take that let you let you listen to your mother. Listen to your daddy. When you find a girl, let your mother check out. Let your mother listen to me. You say, Oh, the bird listen to me. Let your mother check out. Let your mother hear our friend. Because understand me, what they poured into you and what they've given you is a heritage that you pass on to the next generation, friend. Hey, that is a godly heritage, friend. And listen to me. Hey, Luke 15, it wasn't a problem with the son leaving home. It's how he left home. That's right, that's right. You're about to leave home soon. Listen to your parents. Allow them to pour into you. And as you sit down there, as you pass that God here in your own, you sit down and you pick someone that God has you to let your parents check it out. Because hey, if they was good enough to raise you, they can have to help you in that selection. All the other young people, allow and listen to your parents, allow them to their yeah. wow, That's what church is about. Church is about rearing the next generation. Come on, brother. Amen. To the next generation. Church is about helping our children to make the right God decisions. I'm afraid to get all into this internationalism. Hey, you need to get the nuts and bolts of our Christianity. Hey, teaching our kids. Hey, so all the conferences are fine. Hey, let me get back. Churches. Let's teach our children the word of God. See, that's the most important thing. Line upon line, precept, and upon precept. Hey, it's the word of God. We, we, we spend money. Get to my message. We spend money, we send them off to colleges, we put them inside this camp, we do all those type of things, but we refuse to give them the word of God. Sometimes we punish them with you wear the new night. Punish them with God. Not the God. Wow. Sometimes we take them all these other places and we sit down and we refuse to give them God. Right. Right. We open up and we take them to the movies, we take them this place right. and take them that place, but we refuse our family devotions. Right. 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 We sit down there and we say, hey, y'all can dress however y'all want to dress, do whatever y'all want to do, and then be shocked when she comes over to bed. Right. Right. Why are we surprised? Yeah. Why are we surprised at what we're producing when we're not following the book? Right. Right. You know, Jehoshaphat said, Stood in the congregation. The God is sovereign. Let's get back to God. Let's get back to focusing on who He is. He's a sovereign God. He rules and reigns in our affairs. The Bible, see, and when we read on the side of the side of the same chapter, He's going to say, "The battle is not yours; it's the Lord's." So the trials and testings, yes, they're there, but it's God's trials and testings to mold us and to shape us and what He allowed for us to be. And let's give it to God. Let's give our children to God. Give our families to God. Let's give it all to God. And let's follow His plan. Let's get the second part of this game. Verse 6. He says, verse 7, Art not thou our God to describe out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever. You know, Jehoshaphat stood before the people and he said, God is sovereign. And he sat down and he told the people, God is our advocate. God is our friend. You know, when we go through our trials and testing, sometimes we reach a lonely place. You know, being in leadership, it's lonely. Being a pastor, it's lonely. Sometimes being pastor's children, it's a lonely road. You know, and the Bible tells us there's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. You know, when we sit down and we think about Jesus, Jesus is that I. You know, when we go through our trials, we go through our testings, the person who would help us through each and every trial, each and every testing, is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when we wake up in the morning, we begin to read our Bibles, we go through it our day. God would put that verse back in our mind to draw down memory. Hey, I will stick with you. I will be with you. I've never seen my seed forsaken. Yes, They've never been begging bread. Hey, I've stepped by you through the thick and thin. Hey, he'll never leave your side, yes, friend. Hey, he'll stick with you through every situation, yes. whether it's a health situation, whether whatever it is. God said, I'll be there. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Neither will I cast thee aside. God is a good God. He will stick by us each and every day. You see, God will never leave our side because, hey, He made us a promise. Yes, so, we're His children. And, and if we're God's children, it means that we're sealed. We, we, we can't even think ourselves with the family of God if we want. That's right. We in His hand. He is in God's hand. And we sealed by the Holy Spirit for everything. Hey, listen to me. We are so talking that God let us come. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, That's God, good. He's our advocate. He's our friend. So, next time when you feel as if you know what I know, they're going through this, think about God. He never be me nor forsake me. We read on. It says in verse 8. And they dwelt therein, and have built thee the sanctuary. 
they're in for it like me to say. Verse 9. If when evil cometh upon us as a soul, judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. No, take your Bibles. Let's look at First Chronicles. I want to show you something this is very important. Can you all see the beauty of it? First Chronicles 29. It says, Furthermore, in verse 1, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. Now, so David is talking about building the temple. And the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God, the temple that he's building. It says, Now I have prepared preparation for hope. David said, I prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for things to be made of gold, and the silver for things to be made of silver, and the brass for the things of brass. Let's look in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Verse 6. Look at verse 19. 6 and 19. It says, Have respect, therefore, to the prayer. The temple has been made. Solomon has built the temple. This is the ordination service of the temple, the building dedication. And in verse 9, he's talk, verse, in chapter 6, he's talking to God. He says in verse 19, he says, Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant, and his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee, that thine eyes may be opened upon this house, day and night, upon the place whereof thou hast said, that thou wouldest put thy name there to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayed toward this place. Now it's talking about two things. It's talking about if they're far away from the temple of God, they pray towards the temple of God. If they're in the temple of God, Solomon is saying, when I pray, this is before worship even happens, when I pray, God, I want you to hear whoever prays in this temple. Let's look inside 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And verse 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, meaning God, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto their prayer that is made in this place. Let's look inside 2 Chronicles verse 20. Jehoshaphat in verse 4. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of God, help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation in that same place, in that same temple that Solomon has ordained for God. said, hey, when my people pray, I want you to hear it. And then we sit down and we read in 2 Chronicles 70, that my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from the wicked way in this place. Then we sit down and become the 2 Chronicles 20 in verse, in verse 5. It says, Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation in that same place. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, right. you know, as we look okay. through the Bible, the house of God, the temple represents the church today. And you know, the Bible says, whatever we bind here on earth, is bind in heaven. Right. Whatever we loose here on earth is, is loose in heaven. You know, when we sit down and we think about the temple, the temple played an important part in the Jews' lives. You see, wherever they go, they would sit down and pray towards the temple. If they were in the temple and Solomon covered it, Solomon said, Hey, if my people pray, go, I want you to hear them in this place. Why is it that we're straying away from the house of God? Why is it that the church isn't important to us anymore? Why is it that we spend more time? We have, we have a lot of other We are part of the one. We are part of the one. I got part of nothing. 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 We are part of Rotary. We are part of every outreach. Except the main outreach. 
be a part of every program that raises and support this and, uh, and the race for the cure. I'm like, those things are good, friend. I, I do it. I take kings with kids and we sit down and we do all that stuff. So my boss and yeah, we do all that good stuff. Hey, but the most important thing is the work here that we do inside this church. And Solomon, not Solomon, and Jehoshaphat, when really he prayed, he prayed in this place. We have a two or three gathered in my name, there I am in the, in the midst. The Bible says, I inhabit the praise of my people. Where is that located? Inside this place. When we sit down, we make decisions inside this place. It's inside the church that Jesus Christ started. Jesus Christ started this church in John chapter 3. When he came on the shore, he sat down there. He said, follow me and I'll make you Christians of men. The word church means call of assembly. When he came on the shore, he called them out. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 68, he says this. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Some people got it confused. No, the church wasn't built on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't built after the fact. The church was built with Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ built the church, the church will last. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. What is this rock? Peter made the statement, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So when we come to this place, and we make decisions. When we bring our families to, to this place, and we make decisions, and we try to rear our families in, in this place, we will make decisions. Preparation for hope. Amen. You see, yeah, that's check this out. Right. When you go through your trials and destinies, the first person, hey, Pastor Kerry, you can come. Or this one, Pastor Kerry, you can bury the fruit. When he ain't in the church, and yes, <laughs> I can take him with me. You can't do nothing there. Immediately when we run into trouble, we, we know where to come. Yeah. So why make the trouble come? Okay. Why don't we get involved in this place? There's nothing on the friend. Hey, the Bible says the church is the pillar ground of truth. Hey, this is the house, this is the spiritual hospital for people that are sick. But a lot of times when we come to this house, hey, it's a problem. You, you think I lie. When you sit down, think about it. We sit down and we do prayer requests. I got to spoke it. What's that spoken? I can't say it another way, but this is because I know you're boss and I need God to pray for me. So, <laughs> so I get the four unspoken. Y'all will be praying for the pastor today. This is what's happening today. But the pastor right there, be praying for it. I can pray for the four unspoken sister so and so. Hey, listen, I can be your dad. Yeah. Word unspoken prayer request. That's sad. That's sad, no, Sugo. We spend more time gossiping. Listen to me. Hey, we sit down and we're supposed to invite people to come to church, and people are so scared to come to the house of God because why? We're so judgmental. We don't follow the book. No, we, don't, we don't do what the Bible has said. When we sit down and we bring them to the house of God, we're supposed to read them, we're supposed to teach them. The Holy Spirit's supposed to teach them, lead them and guide them into all truth. We're supposed to disciple them, get them into the church, get them saved, baptized, and teach them the doctrine to the word of God. That's what Paul did to Timothy. That's what he did to Titus. He got them involved. And pray. We're supposed to bring people to this place where they're scared to come to this place because of how we live. Alright, that's what you're right, I'm sitting down, think about it as a movement. We said that we get the New Testament camp, we get the Liberty camp, we get the Victory camp, we get the Baptist Bible camp, we get the Gospel Night camp, we get every camp there is. And no one can read it for God. You said we're going to household. Hey, no one's focused on Almighty God, what God would have for us to do. We can't fight for them. No, I can't fight for them. They brother. Right. So when we sit down and we say, well, we're part of the body of Christ. We're supposed to be together, serving Almighty God, working together, because why? There's one common goal. That's honor and glory of God. We serve an audience of one. That's the one who died the cross and death for our sins. Nobody else. And since he's that audience, Paul said, if I be a servant of any other person, I should not be able to minister unto him. So when I stand before him, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We don't stand before people right here horizontally. We stand before that man vertically. Right. Who's up above us? So ladies and gentlemen, when we sit down there, we say, come to this place. We want people to come to the house of God yes. to worship. We want people to come to the house of God. Hey, Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, I need help inside this area. Pastor, I need you to sit down and help me and take care of the situation. And we sit down there because we have brothers and sisters who would actually pray. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to rethink our options. Do the same thing over and over again. It's insanity. Right. We want to produce healthy young adults. We want to produce young adults who are on fire and loving Almighty God. And so many times we spend time fighting against one another. We had a sweet goal so they will sit down there and listen to it. And we won't even say, let's go pray for the brother or pray for the sister or this person. And we sit down and get tasked with what's up. We create a whole group for foolishness. But we want to feed the whole group and say, let's go sit down. The Bible says this. The thing I like, read the nations. Ye who are spiritual, restore such a world. That's why. And we sit down, we think the brother is so fallen. Yeah. Or then the sister is so fallen. Ye who are spiritual. So what I said about you, you have your woodside group about that person. Ye who are spiritual. Yeah. Restore such a 
Ladies and gentlemen, we got to follow the Bible. Amen. We got to get back to the book. And if we sit down and we follow God's word and we do things God's way, we ain't got much unspoken prayer requests. Because we know the brothers and sisters can actually pray. And they won't talk about it, so they got our back. And if they don't have our back, we will advocate with the Father. Jesus told me, let's read on. It says inside verse 10. It says, Now, and now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. You know, last sweeting, last week, he made a statement in the session that we had on Tuesday. And he said, we need to be able to identify our enemy. You know, in Jehoshaphat's prayer, he talks about the sovereignty of God. He talks about God being our advocate. He talks about the place of hope, which is the local church, the temple at that time, the local church for us. <coughs> then he sits down and he identifies the enemy inside his prayer. He says, Moab, I'm born, Mount Seir. That's our enemy. And what is their intent? The Bible tells us in Isaiah verse 11, Behold, I say now, they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. Paris, our possession. Verse 13. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. The enemy wants to destroy our families. The enemy wants to destroy our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the enemy, and we're sitting down and giving him free leverage to do exactly what he wants. The enemy is out to get us. The Bible says, Simon, Simon. The devil desires that hardly they may sift you as weak, but he has our advocate. But I pray for you Amen. that thy faith fail not. Amen. You know, Pastor Sweden said, the reason why we're failing is because we're not identifying our enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, who's our enemy? It's not the person next to us. Right. It's not another local New Testament church. The Bible says, for we rest not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against evil wickedness, and high places. The Bible says, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, for the pulling down of strongholds, the spiritual warfare that we're in, and we spend time fighting with one another, and we don't realize what we're doing spiritually. We're just giving the devil free reign, and he's getting ground, and he's getting ground. If you sit down, you think I'm lying. When Jesus Christ went all over to the other side, he cast the demon, and the demon said, Legion. The devil. Here's what he said. He said, put me into the swine. Because he wanted to stay inside the, the region. You see, what was happening, if you sit down and you read the whole book of Luke, Jesus Christ was going from city to city to city. The capitalists at the time had ten major cities. As he was going from city to city, he was basically planting the bird. He was planting the bird. And the Bible says that region took over the whole region. And so, picture this. Let us go over onto the other side. They went over onto the other side and a storm came. What a coincidence. That storm came, and they sit down and all that stuff. They said, peace be still. And he climbed the storm with mind of mind and this. And he got over to the other side and went where the legion. A mind change. So what the devil was trying to do, stop him from going over to that region to cast the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a spiritual warfare that we fail to realize in the day. Every morning we say, the devil has a tired in our back. He wants to destroy our lives. He wants to destroy our marriages. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to plimage our children. He wants to rape and rob our lives. And we're allowing the devil to do it. And we're sitting down there. We're not doing anything to come back to the devil. Because the devil has control of our hearts. And we're chained. And we sit down there. We're so joined to our idols. We refuse to let it go. We refuse to give God the free reign of our lives. And we're tampering with the devil. The Bible says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. For any man of the world, love the Father, don't think God is inside the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. God lets us know, hey, that's your enemy. And Simon, Simon, the devil desires to have thee. That's another enemy. And that's the one that we live with each and every day, our flesh. All right. Yes, that's right. That's our enemy. Three enemies. And the greatest of them is our own flesh. That's right. The greatest hindrance to revival, we look at it and we dress up every single morning. Flesh. No, the verse that Brother Justin and I said, Great peace. The devil does thy God, and nothing shall offend. And my dad would say, It's hard to offend a dead man. 
That's what Jesus said. You think they're lying. That's what Jesus said. You cannot be my disciple unless you take up your cross and you follow me. What did Jesus do with the cross? He died to himself. That's right. So that we might have life. That's right. No, Jesus, the apostle, is made a statement. He said, who's sitting on the throne of your heart? If it's you, that means Christ is dead in your life. Oh. If it's Christ, that means you were dead inside you. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to be able to identify our enemy. We're doing a poor, if we identify our enemy, it's hard for us to sit down there and know that this is our enemy. And we're continually doing it on a daily basis. That's difficult. Because unless we want our families to fail, unless we want our children to fail, see, we, we know it's the word of God. So after this week, it's not what we're going to do. What are the things we're going to put in place? We can sit down there after the whole conference is done. We can sit down, we can leave it out. Pastor, say, Pastor, we need to have some discipleship class. Pastor, hey, we need to start some youth group where we sit down, we read the Bible, we talk about our devotions that we did. We need to start something. Because it ain't just going to come for a whole week and sit down and do the same thing. Because we go through the same cycle. We go from this conference, the Baptist Bible conference, the New Testament New conference, and we sit down and we up here, and we start all this all over again. We do a bunch of Plymouth Center and Ray Whitney, and we sit down and we come back next year. Oh, and we sit down and we have testimony again. No, that ain't right! To do the same thing over and over again, expect with different results, that's insanity. Yeah, that's right, brother, that's right. We gotta change the cycle. And we want in that same time spot, we want this one drop, oh, that one drop, oh, that one get pregnant, that one get AIDS, that one sit down in jail. And we sit down and be like, what happened to Christianity? We're doing the same thing over and over again. We gotta change it. If we identify that standard, we need to stay so far from the enemy that it looks so strange to do a bunch of bigots to this world. But we sleep, we talk, we chill up with the enemy each and every day. Right. We refuse to separate ourselves from the enemy. That's why we like it. The Bible says, break it in secret is sweet. Yeah. But you said, nah, you listen to your little song, you listen to your little love song. That is sweet for the moment. What is in the line? You said, nah, break it, God's body. Everyone broke up. I'm going to love my mommy in my bed. I'm sorry, everyone's not breaking up again. All that stuff, I used to have a love song. Everyone's not in with Sam Smith, Maroon 5. All that stuff, they all do that. I don't know what I don't want. Pray what I don't want. All that stuff, I don't want. But nonetheless, break it in secret is sweet. We have struggles. It's a normal fact. You ain't nobody said you don't have struggles. Our own might be music, your own might be drinking or smoking, whatever it is, we don't struggle, but we need to get it right. 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 Okay, you put it. We can sit down there, pray that we need to get it right because, hey, we want God to work inside our lives. Yeah. Let's get our last point in this and then we done. It says in verse 11, Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Now, after Jehoshaphat prayed, he declared that God is sovereign. He declared that God is our advocate. He declared that the house of God is this place, this is this the place where we can find hope? Yes. He sits down and he shows us the enemy of hope inside our lives, the world of flesh and the devil. Then he sits down and he tells us what the enemy wants. He wants our little ones. He wants our wives. He wants our children. I'm going to give you four points and then we're going to end. Four quick points. It says, Then upon Jehazi, the son of Zachariah, the son of Bino, the son of Jia, the son of Matna, a Levite of the sons of Asaph came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. So basically, as the Apostle is praying, this Levite got the Spirit. And God began to use him and speak through his mouth. Right. And here's what he said, verse 15. And he said, Parking ye, all Judah, and the inhabitants, parking ye, all the churches and the inhabitants. And thou, King Jehoshaphat. You see, you got to understand, Jehoshaphat, he feared. He was afraid, it says in verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. So when God was speaking, God used his mind. God said, he says, hearken. I want you to take heed. I, I want you to listen. I want you to, to, to drop what you're doing and pay attention just for a moment. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat. He's talking to the king. This Levite is talking to the king. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, 
nor dismay. By the reason of this great multitude, ladies and gentlemen, don't be afraid. The trials and testings, the storms, the bills, the sickness, whatever, is be not afraid. For the battle is not yours, but God. You know, that's one of the hardest things to realize. Here's why. This is tomorrow, ye go down against them. That's our first one. We're going to have to face the enemy. He says, Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerusalem. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. That's hard. You know, as human beings, we, we want to sit down there, we have some financial problem, we want to go to Cornwall Bank, we want to get a loan for this, we want to do that, go to Royal Bank, find a loan shop. We have some sickness, we try all the doctors. Yeah. We have some problem, we read all the books, five steps of happiness, seven steps of prosperity, and we still mad and broke. <laughs> we try everything there is. We sit down and say, you know what, I feel as if I'm in effect of seven effective habits, what Stephen Covey We read that book and it's still in effect. And you know what, I feel like when it was done for Christ, you're not. That's right. And we sit down and we try to use all that psychology and we start messing with God and say, I get something now, new pastor. And God said, I don't accept that strange worship. That's right. Strange fight. Right. If it ain't my book, if it ain't the spirit and the truth, I'm one. That's right. God. That God said, if you can worship me, worship me, my way. Not your way, not what you think can get done. Not what the world tells you, because that peace ain't my peace. This is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you my word. And so many times we try to get it done our way. I think with the woman, the issue of blood for 12 years. The Bible says she heard that Jesus was passing by. Yeah. The Bible says she, she came in the press behind. And she said, if I could just touch the hem of his God, yes, I shall be made cool. I read about the woman. She sat down there for 12 years with that same issue. The Bible says she went to all the doctors and she grew worse. You might have gone to the best doctors. She sat down there. She going to Dr. Ferguson. She going to Dr. Who? What's the doctor's name? Mommy? The doctor's name you like? Sorry. Something like that. But she going to my mommy doctor. She going to everybody doctor. The doctor couldn't help her. The Bible says she grew worse. I know. Uh, but guess what? She heard that Dr. Jesus was passing by. Yes, uh, when she heard that Jesus was passing by, she made up her mind and said, I just go to him. You see, because I heard in that same chapter, I heard I needed the lame man. I needed Jairus' daughter. I heard what he did with the storm. If I can get to him, I know we can turn my stage around. The Bible says she came in the press. I understand. If they had found this woman among normal, regular people, like I said, it was going to stone her because she had an issue of blood. The Bible says she's supposed to be outside the city. Right. If they found her, they were going to stone her. Everything she touched was made unclean. That's right. And the Bible says she came in the press behind, on the floor. If I would touch his hand. She didn't say, if I get these, if I talk to him, hey, tell me, peace be still. No, 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 no. He said, if I just want to touch the hand. Yes, she right. had enough faith, if I just touch his clothes, I shall be made cool. But she came in the press behind, she touched it, and Jesus said, that's it, touch me. Right. Yes, the disciples said, Jesus, people are coming here, did you? Everyone from you. Yeah. This one touching you, that one touching you. I need my hand. You know you're being great. Everyone touch you. No, it's not a regular touch. It's a special touch. See, because the Bible says virtue left him. Yeah. You see, this was someone who touched him, who brought a situation to Jesus, who was in need. This was someone who recognized their situation, exhausted all their human resource, and said, I need to get to God. Yeah. And when she came to God, God said, to touch me. Yeah. And here's what he said. He looked at the woman, the woman said, I touched you. <laughs> and the Bible says, as soon as she declared it public, the Bible says, she was made oh, just a tongue fountain dried up. But she made it public. Wow. Pastor, you all going to verse against that unspoken word. That's this one right there. When she made her issue public. You see, we have to come to the place inside our life. It doesn't matter what the person next to us thinking. That's right. That's right. Our relationship is one between the word of God and us and God. That's right. We have to come to that place where we sit down there, we gotta get to God. We need to sit down there and stop worrying about the person next to us, what they think if I come to the altar, what they think if I say this. But if, listen to me, you can remain in your situation for 12 years. Yeah, right. That's right. Not being here. When I sit down there, it's, it's hard just to stand still and say, God, hey, the battle is yours. Because we want to do so much. Here's our first point tonight. Our first point tonight. It says inside verse 17. 
It says, you shall not need to fight in this battle. That's right. Set yourselves. In essence, he's telling them, I need you to prepare. You see, God is talking to us about it. And this preparation is a unique preparation as we look on inside this chapter. He says, number one, set yourselves, organize yourself, mortify your members, put off and put on. Set some things in order. Yes, amen. Then he goes on, he says, stand ye still. That's right. That's hard. You know, we sit down there, we have problems, we... We try to go to this one, we go to that one, we talk to that prayer, we talk to that one, and God said, yes, we can stand still. See, Jehoshaphat, where you are right now, beside that place, you're in this place. You see, you're in the house of God. You don't need to run about this. I'm, in, I'm there. I, I, I'm in the presence. I am there with you. I'm your advocate. I reign sovereign. I am there with you. Stand still. If you might move, you might move too much, and you find yourself out of the house of God. In the midst of your trials and testing, stand still. Just stay right there. Set yourself there. Set up shop right here. Set up home right here and stand still. Don't. Because you're in the right place. You see, when you sit down and say, well, I can be better off in that church. I can be better off in that church. Or I should go to Harvest. Or I should go to Beacon. Or I should go down there. I should go. No, you stay in your church. You bloom where you're planted. You do what God asks you to do at that church. Because what? God has a plan for your life. You can have say, I gain liberty. I gain. No, no, no. Stay. Church. Bloom that you had to go have you there for a reason. Yeah, right. Don't just be all up and about. Hey, stay there. Situations will happen. You might go down from another situation. Just stay where you are. Yeah, yeah. We get enough down there. Don't stay. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Down, don't stay. We get problem trust. We get problem forces. But when people kill everybody and drug you just go street, we get enough problems. Don't stay where you are. Yeah. Don't move on us. <laughs> so God says, set yourself in order. Then he says, stand be still. And here's what he says. And see the salvation of the Lord. Set yourself. Set up shop where you're at. Understand, you're in the house of God. He says, stand ye still in the house of God. Then he says to them, he says, see the salvation, the deliverance of Almighty God. Where are they? They're in the house of God. If you believe you can find deliverance someplace else other than the house of God, your life is. If you feel as if you can find salvation, not spiritual salvation, but deliverance outside of God's word, you're lying to yourself. If you believe you can find good success outside of God's word, you're lying to yourself. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. If you believe you can find boldness and courage and all those good things outside of God, you're lying to yourself. And it's going to be lying to our Get the five you see it. Get the five you see it. Get a scholarship to UB. Get a government job. Work good. And you will live good. No! Trouble still will come. Only what's done for Christ will last. We're talking about preparation for hope. And so when that child plays that situation, what they can do? Trust the BJC. Dying help me. Trust the BGCSE. Well, dying help me. Go to my professors and you'll be with them. And listen to me. Education is important. Don't get me wrong. Listen, education is really important. Because yeah. we got some people who can't read. Can I write? We need one of that stuff. I mean, they need to come down 12% of them now, so you know we need to come down a little bit of change we get. So you know 12% of them bring everyone skinny. Trust me on it. I saw a post the other day, right? <laughs> on Facebook, and a friend of mine said, put the ball in, he said, Lord, if you get slim stomachs, do that for me, Lord, please do that for me. Trust me, wait till back up, wait till July 1st, you're talking about slim stomachs, you're talking about slim, and then they go, sick. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, we have to stay where we're planted. The Bible says, set yourself. He says, I want you to sing. Now here's, here's the important part before we go, before we close. He says, and see the salvation of the Lord exactly. with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow will go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to prepare our churches. We're going to prepare our families. We need to understand that God, He's our advocate. He's sovereign. The place of hope is right here in our local churches. Our enemy is the flesh, the world, and the devil. We understand that God wants us inside our local churches. He wants us, hey, to set up shop, to set yourself. He wants us to stand, he still, don't move but now, just stand and listen to that still small voice. Then he sits down, he says this, and I want you to see. 
keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Yeah. The storms will come. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, Peter looked outside and he began to sink. But when he kept his eyes on Jesus, he actually walked on water. And he looked back and forth, and then when God had the same, he said, Why this out there? Yeah. Don't doubt it. Keep your eyes fixed on him. So. Seeing him. The Bible tells us that we should set our affections on things above. Yeah. We should keep our eyes and keep our vision on Almighty God because, hey, if we stray away and we think we can find it someplace else, we're going to lose and we're going to fail. We're failing now. So if we get our eyes and draw back and go, our prosperity can come our way. Because here's what's going to happen. He says in verse 9, he says, And the Levites and the children of the Kohats and the children of the Korites stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went forth to the wilderness of Tekio. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. That's right. Believe in his prophets, the pastors that he's given us, so shall ye be, so shall ye prosper. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the house of God is important. Preparation for hope. We can find hope in the house of God. We can find hope in the Word of God. We can find hope in the man of God. The man of God that God has blessed our woman, but we are great men of God. You know, I, I thank the Lord for Pastor Ivy Carey. You know, Amen. I went through a difficult time. I remember what the blue pastor Carey just called me and said, Brother, I just want to pray with you. And I sat down and I said, Wow. That went, that went a long way. One day I know my church, my church people always pray for me. They sent me the notes. They called me the notes. I was you asked under my dad's. But I said you ten hats, one hat. I read all these things in the week. The people can find me. But they be praying. But when I sit down with Pastor Gary, I said, "Let's call and tell you I'm praying for you." Yeah. When you read the book of Titus, the older men help the younger men. Wow. The older women help the younger women. Real men in this place. We have to pour the right things into our young people so they can be established. That's right. yes. this, we can't find establishment outside of God's world. That's right. The world, yes, it's glamorous. Mm -hmm. That success, the chase after those things, it's glamorous. But when we step for Christ, we Let's read on in verse 21, we're ending right now. It says, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. And that should praise the beauty of holiness. Wow. Now, remember I told you this preparation is a little bit different. Our preparation is different from the preparation of the world. Here is why. Jehoshaphat is preparing to go into battle. Here is what he did. He put the singers up front. <laughs> Normally, if it's a regular war, they would put their best men up front. Yeah. That means that inside this battle, we got AJ up front. We got Dylan up front. We get Dre, we get Linda, we get Gibson, we get all of them up front. The people who could say, get people like me in the back. Way back. Yeah. All the way in the back. But inside this battle, we have the singers up front. Why are you singing before you fight? Because the battle is not yours. Yeah. It's the Lord. I, I don't know one battle that God loves. I, listen to me, if you can name it, you better than me. I don't know one battle. Hey, that went against him, he lost that one. The devil went against him, he lost. Get me behind me. I don't know one battle. Check the general consensus. God don't lose, friend. That's right. Amen. I don't know. Just gotta lose, friend. No. Our preparations will be different. So when we sit down and we talk about preparation for hope, we gotta set ourselves in this place. Yes, amen. We gotta stand ye still in this place. Yeah. We gotta sit down there and get plugged in into our local churches. Hey, the glitter, the glamour, the bigger and the complain, y'all can go stand up for someone else who cares, but get busy serving God. So we, we always have problems, we always have those things. Get busy serving God. Whether this one right, whether that one wrong. Hey, you fight over those things. Get busy serving God. Hey, after this week is done, let's meet with our churches, let's meet with the pastors, let the preachers get together, some of the young Hey, what are we gonna do in UB? What are we gonna do inside our local places? What are we gonna do in our communities? Because why? We gotta get busy doing something for God. Don't just sit down there. It's a beautiful conference. Every message was great. Now what we can do? Are we gonna set ourselves in this place? Are we gonna stand each step? Because listen, if we sit down, we put the singers over front of you, the victory is ours. Let's prepare God's 
Let's not prepare like we were. Let's not sit down there and get off kilted and allow the world to entice us. It's enticing, but set your mind, set your mind. Hey, I want both. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, like God is speaking to us, our enemy is the world of flesh and the devil. Guess what he wants? He says this, verse 13, our little ones, our wives, and our children. What's at stake? What's being in the balance? Families, That's right. the next generation. That's right. The Bible tells us the rules of generation do not go because the fathers fail to teach in the works and wonders of God. But the young men inside my church, I know sometimes they probably get mad and say, but a father trying to run my life. Not really. I try to warn them. You know what I tell them? I said, find out what God has for you. Do that. But when you find out what is God's purpose, you see, I find out young adults, but I find out God's purpose, they've been off the Bible college, and now they just sit down there and they do nothing. Right. What are they doing for God? When Adam found out what God or how to do, God gave him the purpose in the Bible as he started tending to the God. Right. And then, God gave him a help. That's right. We get this thing confused, especially our young adults. They sit down and they go on their first year and they find one. <laughs> Honestly, you that way. So I don't find that funny because why? You can damage your life. You get your life plugged up with God. You get on fire. Show yourself faithful to God and allow God to plug it into your life. Because don't put the car before the horse, spread. Get yourself plugged into God's word. Hey, be a man of God. Get it up in the book. Right. Amen. We get a lot of preachers. They sit down and they come and they use all the opportunity to preach God's word. The Plymouth, they attack and do all those things. No. Get plugged into God's word. What are you yeah. doing for God? Preparation for hope. We want to salvage this next generation. We want to do something for God inside this next generation. Yeah. Hey, I sit down and look at all the generations, Pastor Kerry, look at all these great men, all these men of God, just down there going off, but a hope went off the scene, I'm about to go off the scene. Go on that. I look at Gibson and I see Gibson so plush hair, ball, and just full bear. I said, look at Gibson getting over there. I said, Gibson, I think my ball in my hair. He said, but don't do that. He said, but the only reason why I go there is because my hair lying in the back here. I said, but you're lying in the back here. I said, I'll walk all of them. I think it's a new style. I think my ball in my hair. I said, but you're going to do it. But I think I'm going to do that. I said, but this is true. Nonetheless. But we want to pass off the scene. We get AJ, we get Dylan, we get all we get the John Mark Francis, we get the Geo, we get all these, we get the Ru I love the Russes. I think they so I, I love this children. I think they're wonderful kids. Amen. We get them right there. They're the next generation. Right, right. Our generation, what are we doing for them? Are we showing them how to fight each other? Are uh, we sure I'm pouring the right things into their lives? Because oh, I'm pretty sure that, that they look and they watch and they do all those things. And yes, we will make bad decisions, we will do certain things. And we need to get interrupted and we need to show them exactly what needs to be done. Friends, I love my young people inside my church. I love every one of them. I love the young people inside our movement. Listen to me, I would do anything. They call me, whatever it is, I would try my best to be there. But we need to do it as our local churches. We're doing it in just to our churches and to our young people, and we fail to give them the word of God. I'm sure that we're doing it, but after this week, then what? We have obedient conferences, obedient testimonies, then what we can do? Just sit down and close up and do what? Preparation for hope. Set yourself. Yes, sir. Stand ye still. See the salvation of God. We try to prepare any other way. The deliverance of God. It's going to have every head power in reality. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look at our lives, the Bible tells us that trouble will come. Man 